With that pick, Chicago selected the next member of our starting 11. Chicago Bears first round selection. Dan Hampton, defensive tackle, Arkansas. We got Hamp, uh, you know, you knew he was going to be a great one. He'll be a Hall of Famer. Dan Hampton did not waste any time making his mark on the NFL. He started 16 games in his rookie year and made the Pro Bowl in his second. Dan Hampton, uh, one of the best football players I've ever seen play. Uh, just a big, physical, intimidating presence in the middle of the line who could not be blocked. At six foot five and 264 pounds, Hampton was a versatile player. He made two Pro Bowls as a defensive end and two as a defensive tackle. Nicknamed the Danimo for his aggressive play, Hampton was also known as a leader and a selfless teammate. I think the defensive players were real close to each other. I mean, a lot of my best friends are on the defensive line and the linebackers, and we spend a lot of time together, and we uh, more or less have a real team concept here, and I think that's important. Hampton knew John Wayne. When Hampton shows up, uh, something great's going to happen. When you go in a war with Hamp, that's, that's great, because if he can walk, he's going to play it. He'll make great plays. Peter Brock, under pressure. He was really, to me, the key to the 46 defense because he created the havoc in the middle of the field that allowed others to make the plays. He was the guy who absorbed all the double teams and who, who I think really most offensive coaches game plan for. Hampton had nine sacks or more in a season five times. And he was named to the all NFL team of the 1980s. I think Dan Hampton, although he hurt, hurt his knees, he was unblockable and really tough as a tackle. In 2002, he was elected to the Hall of Fame. And even in Canton, he was thinking about his teammates. Leave here today, and I go back over, and I walk into that sacred ground. I'm thinking about everyone I played from high school to college to Chicago. Like I said, today you know why I've never walked alone. Dan Hampton was just uh, willing to sacrifice uh, his body and his mind for the success of a team. Dan Hampton was symbolic of what being a Bear is all about. The man who played alongside Hampton for nine seasons will also play alongside him on our starting 11. Defensive tackle, Steve McMichael. When I walked out the tunnel, not too much mattered to me. I didn't, you know... That was all superficial. The mechanism is cleared tunnel vision. Here's where I want to do, and this is where I want to go. And nobody's going to stop me from that. Steve McMichael, he's a very deranged, very unstable person. Nobody was tougher than McMichael, who was like a guy who, who uh, hunted rattlesnakes barehanded. Steve McMichael, to me, was the embodiment of the tough Bears defenses of the mid-80s. Uh, he was the most consistent, most durable, uh, most try-hard guy you'd ever find in your life. Despite being selected in the third round, McMichael didn't even last a half a season in New England. Got him from uh, New England Patriots. Uh, they, uh, we wanted to make a center out of him, but uh, when I saw his uh, personality, I knew that he'd be a great defensive player. McMichael would be great, making two Pro Bowls, recording 92 and a half sacks, and being the all-time Bears leader in games played. But he still went unnoticed at times because he played alongside other greats. That's often the case in a lot of teams. You have one good player, there's usually two. If you look closely enough, one might be more famous, but the reason he's famous and the reason he's good is he's got a sidekick. Our defense was me and Hampton in the middle and Richard Dean in the end. All the other defenses had two great ends and one defensive tackle, not two. Walker, the long back inside the 15, Wilson back to the middle, throws the right side, the ball yeah. in the air, intercepted, the man who kicked it was Steve McMichael! Steve McMichael was, in a lot of ways, I think the heart of the defense. So obviously he was... He was a big part of everything the Bears accomplished in the 80s. Playing with arguably the two best tackles in Bears history did help improve the game of William Perry. Perry still will always be known for his touchdown runs, 
even though he had just five carries in 1985 and just eight carries in his career. That's not what I remember William Perry for. Uh, he did such a great job of clogging things up that allowed everybody else to go more. He took up a man and a half space, not just by being there, but he was quick in a five-yard area. Although he gained a lot of notoriety during his rookie season, Bridge proved he wasn't a flash in the pan, becoming a solid defensive tackle for eight more years. Richard Depp. In 1983, Bill Tobin was the director of scouting. Tobin loved Richard Dent. He played at a small school. Nobody knew about him. They didn't know his potential. Richard Dent was, uh, that was like a diamond in the rough. Of course, when we got him, he was 235 pounds. Very undersized. No one thought much of him. He was an eighth round draft pick. And uh, the problem had been up to that point is that he had poor dental work. That's why he was so undersized. And once he, he when he got to the Bears, he got his teeth fixed. And he, uh, he, he instantly put on weight and became this monster football player. And down he goes. A loss of yardage. Fast and aggressive, Richard Dent blossomed from the 203rd pick in the draft into the best pass rusher the Bears ever had. Dent reached double-digit numbers in sacks eight times, and his 124 and a half sacks put him atop the Bears' career list. Richard Dent was a guy who his speed coming around the end was really kind of rivaled only by somebody like Lawrence Taylor. I mean, he was quicker than a cat. I mean, he, he could come off that ball. He was unbelievable. I mean, I mean, a tackle had to be really on his toes to get his hands on him. In 1985, Dent had one of the best seasons ever for a defensive player. He led the NFL with 17 sacks, was named first team All-Pro, and helped the Bears win the Super Bowl, where he was named MVP. He became a real force. I mean, he never lost the quickness, but he had all that power and strength to go with it. Should be a Hall of Famer, don't know why he isn't. If you look at a pass rusher that was able to dominate stretches of the football game for the most dominant defense you know, ever, the 85 Bears, Richard Dent deserves his shot and, and his place in the Hall of Fame, too. Richard Dent was a key member of one of the greatest defensive schemes in NFL history. Buddy Ryan's 46 defense. Uh, 46 defense be a defense that was created because all the linebackers were hurt. And as it evolved, it is all about pressure. If you stop a passing game, uh, you can't stop it unless you put pressure on it. Now, some people are good enough to put it on with a three-man rush. Well, we're not. In fact, I don't know what we're good enough to put it on with a four-man rush. If we have to send eight, we'll send eight. We're not going to let you sit back there and pick us apart. We're going to put 11 guys on the field, and we're going to come at you from all different directions. And we're not going to stop. And we're going to hit your quarterback until you get another one in. But we're going to keep coming, and we're going to keep you guessing, and we're going to keep you thinking. We had, at every position, aggressive players, and they were smart. They were experienced. Buddy used to always say, young rhymes with dumb. We do have intelligent players, and we do ask them to use their brain as well as their brawn, and they like it because when they go somewhere else and they tell them just to do it harder, they know there's a more intelligent way to approach the situation, and we try to give them that situation and let them use their intelligence. And, you know, offensive coaches, they like to think they're good. They run people all the field and put them in motion and do all this, and they want you to stand over and let them do what they want to. They don't like it when you don't. <laughs> the thing that we wanted to do and the 46 allowed us to do was um, really audible. And when we went out there and the offense were trying to set us up for, for plays or whatever that they really wanted to run, uh, and the, the quarterback would audible and I would audible and put us back where we were before. In 1985, the Bears boasted one of the best defensive units ever assembled. They led the league in points allowed, holding opponents to 10 or less 11 times in 16 games, and were first in takeaways with 54, or nearly three and a half per game. They were a cocky, uh, arrogant. They'd tell you what they're going to do to you, and as long as they did it, uh, you know, I didn't consider that bragging. I've never seen the team 15 and 1 talk so much, you know? As dominant as they were in the regular season, they were even better in the playoffs. First, they shut out the Giants. 
then the Rams. Back to pass, the rush on. In Super Bowl XX, they forced six turnovers, allowed just seven rushing yards, 123 total yards, and scored twice. Over the left side, he goes. defense has been incredible. <laughs> they knock your socks off just to watch it. Total decimation of the AFC champion New England Patriots. We had so much <laughs> passion for the game and so much pride in what we did. Uh, it's rare that you get a group of guys together. I, I can't think of anybody that wants to win more than Otis Wilson. I can't think of anybody that wants to be the best more than Dan Hampton. I can't think of anybody that, that wants to go to the Super Bowl more than Gary Fensick. I can't think of anybody that wants to be dominant more than Wilbur Marshall. I can't think of anybody that wants to come off the ball like Richard Dent and get to the quarterback every down. Can't think of anybody like Steve McMichael. Can't think of anybody like Fred. I can't think of anybody like that. The 1985 Bears defense is considered one of the best of all time. But while fans can name their front seven by heart, it becomes tougher for some to identify the members of the secondary. And Dieter Brock back to throw, looking right now, looks over the middle. He pops it up. Yeah. Right, and intercepted by Les The secondary didn't get its due, but they were all part of this thing, too. You can't take them out of it. Their corners never got a whole lot of publicity. They had to cover people man on man. You know, playing man to man coverage as much as we did with our 46th defense, it, it, those guys had it covered pretty well. I think it took a bizarre genius type disconnect from reality to think you could do this because you're very vulnerable when you do that because that wide receiver, if he gets past our corners, he's gone. Well. 46, you have to say, your cornerbacks are going to be so good for the first 10 yards on, on the wide receivers that no quarterback's going to have a chance to throw. The Bears' best corner in 1985 was Leslie Frazier, who started every game and led the team with six interceptions. Les Frazier, as good a cover corner as ever played in those years. Frazier had 20 interceptions in his first 65 games as a Bear. But on the biggest stage, Frazier's career came to an unceremonious end. Les Frazier was on his way to a stupendous career. He actually hurt his knee very, very badly in the Super Bowl, getting ready to return a punt on a reverse, I think. Reverse, he hands it off to Frazier, who cuts to his left across the 50, and Frazier is covered up. Oh, boy. Les, Les Frazier, Frazier down. is down to the field. So, unfortunately, Les Frazier hurt himself very badly, and that, that pretty much ham hampered his career forever. But he was on his en route to being an absolutely spectacular cornerback. Leslie Frazier was a good corner. Mike Richardson was a real good corner. Both had long arms, and they could, they could bump you, and that's what, the way they played. Mike Richardson, a second-round pick in 1983, blossomed into a solid cornerback two years later. Mike Richardson was a safety in college. And we came on, we, we, we watched him play, and uh, we were pretty strong at the safety position, so we played him a corner. He had pretty good feet, made some great plays, had a great ability to read the quarterback and break on the ball. Intercepted by Richardson. Touchdown, Mike Richardson and the Chicago Bears! Mike was a good kid. Richardson played six seasons with the Bears and finished with 20 interceptions. The man taken one round after him in 1983 was safety Dave Dewerson who got his chance to start after Pro Bowl safety Todd Bell sat out the entire 1985 season due to a contract dispute. Dave Dewerson was a guy who got his opportunity and he made the most of it. Once he got on the field, the Bears couldn't take him off. Cutting right to the 45, offended by Dave Dewerson. 
made a lot of tackles, did not make a lot of mistakes, and was a leader in the secondary. Dewerson had five interceptions in 1985 and made the first of his four Pro Bowl appearances. Dewerson could blitz and cover. In 1986, he had seven sacks and six interceptions. Dave was a heady guy, a smart guy back there, who not only could play the run, but play the pass, and, and, and we needed that. He complimented Les Frazier and Mike Richardson very well. That secondary was pretty darn good. The man who led the Chicago secondary in 1985 is also the man we chose as a starting safety on our all-time Bears defense, number 45, Gary Fensick. Gary was as, as smart a player to ever play the game in the secondary. Fensick was a wide receiver at Yale and was drafted in the 10th round by the Dolphins in 1976. After getting cut by Miami, Fensick landed with his hometown Bears as a defensive back. You know, they always talk about in the NFL, don't get injured because your backup may never get out of there. And I, I was one of those people. I mean, Doug Plank got injured. Uh, I became a starter. Uh, he came back after four games, and I replaced Craig Clemens, who was a number one pick. Fensick became their starting strong safety, and for the next 10 years, he was a fixture in Chicago's secondary. Gary Fensick was a football player. He was smart, he was tough, he was opportunistic, he could tackle, he could tackle, and he was willing to, you know, to sacrifice his body. He was willing to put a lick on a guy. You might have 70 defensive plays in a game. Every single play, you hope that you have the lick of your life, that you can come in after lifting weights for six months and crush that person, help them up, and go, that was a great hit, you know, and see that film and, and have your teammates go, that was awesome, you know? Fensick's hard hitting, combined with his athleticism and nose for the football, made him a perfect catalyst for Buddy Ryan's 46 defense. Off the middle and he's cut down once again. Gary Fensick leading the charge for Chicago. Mike really was the leader up front, called, and then Gary set the defensive backs and everything, got everybody in place, so he was our leader in the secondary. Fensick made two Pro Bowls and finished his career as Chicago's all-time leader in interceptions with 38. A Chicago native, Fensick still lives in Chicago and roots for the Bears every week. I actually put in my last contract with the Bears 20 years ago that if the Bears ever built a new stadium, that I'd have the right to buy four seats between the 40-yard line. And uh, the Bears honored that. Another member of the 1985 Bears was safety Sean Gale, who played sparingly in 85, but was part of one of the year's most memorable plays. Vendetta from his end zone. Bears will get good field position. Oh, he oh, missed it. This is the football. He missed it. It's on the field. Oh, it's right. It's Sean Gale. I've never seen a punt. Talk him up. So. It's pretty amazing how the wind just took it. And uh, the next thing I know, Sean Gale had it in the end zone. Gale would not become a full-time starter until 1989. But when he did, he forged out the reputation of being a tough player. Sean Gale, even though he didn't look like it was as tough as they got, he played one game, he actually had a, uh, a broken neck, and he, he lost feeling in his hands. He kept playing. I mean, absolutely stunning. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> true story. Gale, who made the Pro Bowl in 1991, is currently third on the team's all-time tackle list. In 24 years later, another Bears middle linebacker was enshrined in Canton. Mike Singletary. When Singletary first arrived with the Bears, he hardly had the look of an all-time great. He was a heavier player when he first came into the league. He and Jim McMahon were the only two players my their rookie year who didn't finish the uh, mandatory 12-minute run on a timely basis, and Buddy Ryan was all over Singletary uh, about that. Mike changed. He lost weight. He was quicker, faster and just was a, an outstanding middle linebacker. Mike was played to run as good as any middle linebacker ever played it. Hey, baby! We're gonna be here all day! We're gonna be here all day, baby! I like this kind of party! The 10-time Pro Bowl, 
neutralized even the game's best running backs. Dickerson the tail, backhand off. Dickerson oh. hit by Singletary. Mike Singletary was a guy who was not the most gifted guy in the world, did not have the prototype size, speed, dimensions that you look for. He couldn't play coverage. We didn't ask him to play coverage. He knew he couldn't play coverage. Despite his shortcomings, Singletary always seemed to be a difference maker on the field. His greatest contribution, though, may have been what he did off it. I never played with a, a person that was more mentally prepared, studied more film. Hey, man, look at here. You gotta watch for that quick pass to the right side. The quick pass to the back, out of bound formation, or either if it's flop, look at him lifting up. If it's flop over there and Sterling Sharp is on the inside guy, you got to be on it. Singletary captained the Bears' famed 46 defense and was the NFL's Defensive Player of the Year in both 1985 and 1988. For our all-time starting 11 defense, our two outside linebackers are two stars from the 1985 Super Bowl champion team, Otis Wilson and Wilbur Marshall. <laughs> Nothing Otis Wilson did was subtle. His hits were big, and he talked a big game as well. Sometimes I'd kind of like, oh, I can't believe he said that. But Otis was uh, one of those that was good at backing it up. He could walk the walk and talk the talk. And if you can back up whatever you're saying, then it, it's not trash talking, it's fact. Hell no, that ain't nothing. In 1985, Wilson recorded a career best 10 and a half sacks. Opposing quarterbacks might not remember his hits, but 20 years later, his teammates still do. Otis hit him blindside so hard that Someone found his tooth on the astral turf. Yeah, players may lose a tooth here or there, but it wasn't a front tooth. It was one of his back teeth that got knocked out. You got to play this game at one level. You cannot play it passive. You cannot play it, you know, with, with that, how do you say, that Holy Spirit, well, well I'm going to take it easy on this guy, or you get your head handed to you. Wilson's partner on the outside was Wilbur Marshall. If you ask our own defensive players who they were most, not afraid of, but didn't want to get on the wrong side of this guy, it'd be Wilbur Marshall. I mean, he had all the speed in the world and just a great athletic body, and he was mean. Wilbur Boutier Marshall was one mean SOB on our defense. In 1985, Marshall's victims were many but none had it worse than the quarterbacks on the Detroit Lions. It was just the last game of the season, and we just wanted to play the game, but make a statement, and at the same time, get out of it healthy. Lions quarterback Eric Hipple survived the onslaught and finished the game. The quarterback Hipple replaced wasn't as lucky. For whatever reason, uh, Buddy called a blitz, and Wilbur Marshall took off. And Joe Ferguson, I don't think, ever saw him. Marshall, Marshall was, uh, man, was he, I mean, I mean, I can still see the lick he put on Joe Ferguson out in Detroit. I'd never seen him like it. I thought he killed him.